Right. So um, I'm an active open source contributor on GitHub to training AI projects like TensorFlow, uh, Keras, uh, some projects by Hugging Face, IBM, the, the sort. Uh, I'm a writer on uh, AI and machine learning data science on medium.com. And uh, I've been working in the uh, machine learning and AI field for the past uh, five years uh, at uh, you know, research institutions, uh, local startups, uh, doing my own side projects. So uh, this is, I guess, uh, what I've been doing for the past, uh, past while. And uh, I picked up TensorFlow uh, ever since uh, its beta, when its beta was still in development. Uh, I started learning TensorFlow and using it since then. So this is just a rundown of what we're going to do today. Uh, I'll start off with some prerequisites, you know, what exactly is needed to, I guess, understand at a high level what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll give a quick uh, refresher to machine learning in general in terms of like uh, the, the terminology I'll be using, some of the, uh, some of the concepts that uh, this talk will cover. And from then on, uh, once we're comfortable with that, we'll move on into uh, PR TensorFlow, what it is, who is using it, uh, what can you do with it, what TensorFlow provides for the average developer slash researcher. And after that, we'll be doing a bit of live coding. So uh, if you have your laptops at hand, you can, uh, you can follow along. Uh, we'll be covering two, uh, I guess, exercises uh, that kind of get you up and running with TensorFlow, the API, the syntax used in TensorFlow, uh, and uh, how you can build uh, data pipelines all the way from, uh, I guess, loading and pre-processing your data, uh, all the way to building your models, training and testing it, and uh, checking its performance metrics. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So at a high level, to understand TensorFlow, you first need to understand what machine learning is. And to understand what machine learning is, you need to have a basic math background, you know, linear algebra, calculus. So even to understand this talk, uh, you need to have some bit of background in, in these two topics. Uh, and then basic understanding of machine learning concepts uh, neurons, layers, activation, uh, neural networks in general, how they work. Uh, you probably also may need to know uh, like a, a fair bit on what uh, a neural network is and what makes it work. Uh, or the underlying architecture or the mechanism inside the neural network that makes it do, uh, makes it do what it's supposed to do. And of course, uh, to even you know, understand the TensorFlow syntax or the TensorFlow API, uh, you need to be proficient in Python in terms of you know, creating functions, working with uh, classes, working with uh, uh, different variables, and you know, using packages, especially for numerical computing and visualization. So now I'll give a quick recap on you know, machine learning in general. So I think we can spend a bit of time touching that before we deep dive into TensorFlow. So machine learning, it's a subset of artificial intelligence. It's where you give data to a computing system. It finds patterns in that data and uh, it's able to uh, predict uh, off of unseen data. So if I have a stock market model, I just train it or train that model on historical stock data, stock price data, and uh, you know, given a few variables, I can uh, get it to predict tomorrow's stock price data with a certain uh, X amount of confidence or accuracy. So machine learning, uh, the two major categories, uh, supervised and unsupervised. Supervised means that your training data set, uh, it consists of both the feature space and the labels. So the features are something that describe the object. For example, if it's an apple, well, you know, we can uh, look at its color, its redness in terms of RGB values. They can be a feature. Its weight, it could be a feature. Its diameter, anything that uniquely describes that object is considered a feature. 
and the label, which means like, yes, it's an apple. Uh, yep, that's the label. So this could also work uh, for other objects like uh, an orange. Same thing, you'd want to take its color, its mass, its diameter with the class label of orange. So that's what supervised learning is. It's where you give all, all the data to the machine learning algorithm to find patterns in it. Semi-supervised, uh, back then uh, it was called unsupervised learning. So now semi-supervised learning is you just give the algorithm just the features. Uh, so the model or the algorithm finds its own patterns in the data either through clustering or some mechanism that it uh, enables it to understand what, uh, what's going on in the data, its distribution and uh, things to describe that distribution. It figures all of it out by itself and given data, given new data that it hasn't seen before, uh, you can use this algorithm to predict off of it seeing which cluster it most probably belongs to. So that's semi-supervised. So neurons, uh, you know, neurons, it's a, it's a terminology, it's, uh, I guess, inspired by the human brain itself, the new neurons in the human brain. Uh, so when you have a neuron, it takes in information from one side and it spits out something after doing something to its input. Similarly, uh, a neuron in machine learning terms, uh, it's a mathematical representation of what the biologi uh, uh, like, uh, biological neuron does. So it, uh, it computes the equation of a line. So you know, in high school we learned that y equals mx plus c is the equation of a line, m being the gradient and c being the y-intercept. In machine learning, uh, the gradient m is called the weight w and the y-intercept C is called the bias B. And X, as you can see in the last point, it is the input. So what a neuron does is it takes the input X, it multiplies it, or it does a dot product uh, with, the, with its respective weight and adds a bias to it. And then it adds this thing called the nonlinearity to it, which is the activation function. So when you have well, a line which is linear in nature, and you have complex data, you want to learn some nonlinear mapping between x and y. Uh, x is the input, y is the output. So you want some nonlinear representation mapping the two. So when you add nonlinearity as an activation function, it enables better learning, it uh, allows the model to find better patterns in the data, and usually nonlinear models, they're more accurate and they're much more versatile when you apply them to real life data. All right, so if you've, I guess if you're familiar with machine learning in general, uh, you would have seen some of these layers. You know, you see the fully connected layer, which is just a stack of neurons, one on top of each other. Uh, convolutional layers, they take in an input uh, image uh, and they con and they perform a convolution function on it. You know, you, if you have an image, you can think of the the convolutional kernel as this flashlight. I'm, uh, uh, you know, scanning the image parts of the image one by one, row by row, uh, and based on that, I uh, after convolving, I have, I guess, a matrix that uh, it it I can figure out the features from that matrix and infer what that object could be or what that image could be after performing a series of convolutional uh, functions on it. Uh, maximum pooling, it's usually a comp it usually accompanies the convolutional layers. Max pooling, it uh, lowers the dimensionality, makes it uh, easier for the model to learn. Uh, so it, uh, so when you have a convolutional layer applied to some input data and you have a max pool layer after that, uh, it lowers the number of uh, parameters in the network and makes it much more lighter. So parameters here refers to the weights and biases in the individual neurons. So if you apply max pooling to uh, immediately after a convolution, it lowers the dimensionality, thus bringing down the par parameter count, making the model faster if you were to put it into production. So flattened, it's, it's a simple concept. If you have an n-dimensional matrix, for example, I have a matrix, uh, two by three matrix. And if I were to apply a flattened layer on it, 
it would give me a six by one vector because two times three is six. And uh, it would just give me a single uh, column or single row uh, after you flatten it. So you can think of uh, the flattened layer uh, as, uh, you know, I, I bring in, I bring in bread, I put it in, and when it goes through the flattened layer, it, you just basically get like a disk at the end. So you can imagine it like that. So it returns a one by m or m by one vector. So when you take these different layers in the previous slide and you put them together in different combinations, you get this thing called the architecture, uh, the neural network architecture. So the architecture, individual layers, they have the parameters, the weights and biases in the individual neurons. So an architecture is just a huge collection of all of them together. So an in an architecture or a model, you take in inputs X and you map them through that entire neural network to the output Y. So when you, through the process of training, uh, when you uh, fine tune the values of W weights, W and biases B in the network, when you train the parameters, uh, the network is becoming, I guess, more adept at uh, creating that representation between X and Y. So when you have, after fully training the network, when you have that final configuration of parameters W and B in all the layers, all the neurons, you can call it a frozen model. And uh, this is the final configuration. You can put that final model into production and use it to predict unseen data. So whatever I mentioned, neurons, layers, architecture, uh, this slide kind of summarizes everything, brings it all together. So all, you know, the yellow dots, green dots, and the purple dots, they're all the individual neurons. And here is just a fully connected uh, layer. Uh, all the four layers, they're fully connected which means they're just a stack of neurons. It takes in inputs, you know, x1, 2, 3, 4, or how many ever inputs you have, and it maps it uh, to the output y. So for example, if I were to take an image, uh, supposing the layer 1, L1, takes in an image, and the network is supposed to predict which class it belongs to out of four, you know, is it y1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, you would build such a network that takes in that image, it does something in the middle, and it spits out the classified value or pertaining to that image. So if I gave it a picture of a car, it would tell me, okay, out of, for example, apple, orange, car, and bus, it would fire that specific neuron saying, yes, this is a bus. Sorry, this, yes, this is a car. So yeah, X to Y mapping, that's ultimately what a neural network is. So TensorFlow is a library built by Google AI. Uh, it, if I'm not wrong, it released, its beta version released somewhere back in 2015. And ever since then, it's one of the largest growing machine learning frameworks on the planet today. Uh, so you use TensorFlow uh, in any one of these languages you're comfortable with. It has lots of support. So you can use it in any one of these languages to build neural networks. And uh, you can train these neural networks in their specific languages. Uh, TensorFlow is even compatible with different kinds of hardware, uh, like you know GPUs, TPUs, and I'll cover that later. Uh, so TensorFlow, it, uh, when you break it down, you get Tensor and Flow. Tensor, you can think of it as an n-dimensional array, and Flow just means the movement or the flow of these n-dimensional arrays uh, through the neural network. Uh, to get that final mapping or representation when you train it. So TensorFlow, it's widely used. Uh, it's used by, uh, you know, lot major corporations. It's used by, you know, all of these. Uh, even the major players in most industries, they use TensorFlow for different projects, uh, different products. Uh, research institutions, even ASTAR, uh, were heavy on TensorFlow for uh, performing some uh, you know, simulations uh, when you're quickly crunching some numbers. TensorFlow is our go-to framework. And you know, practitioners, hobbyists, even now research students in you know, even high school, university, educators, they're all using TensorFlow for their classes. And now, you know, hopefully by the end of this, even you know, you're able to use TensorFlow to a fair extent. So 
TensorFlow, while it has its theoretical uh, usages, you can also use uh, TensorFlow for all these sorts of things. All these sorts of things. So you have Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you know, uh, wait, no, Facebook uses PyTorch, the different thing. So you have Twitter. You have all these companies like Airbnb. They're recommending products to you. Singapore Airlines. They recommend flights to you. So they're all building recommendation systems using TensorFlow. Even uh, social media like uh, LinkedIn, they are heavy uh, on TensorFlow when bringing people together or connecting them or recommending who you should connect with next. Uh, fraud and fault detection, uh, when, when you have a camera and you're focusing on something and you detect a crack in, for example, a piece of metal, you know, you can use TensorFlow for that. Now Twitter is even using, uh, it has a new fake news detection algorithm. So whenever you come across a piece of uh, external news, it'll actually tell you this may be misleading or this news, in, like this news piece may have been manipulated. So please verify. So open source software, we have companies like Hugging Face, all of them using uh, TensorFlow to build their uh, open source projects, giving it, in, uh, you know, putting it into the hands of developers around the world. And you know, again, research applications, companies like uh, OpenAI, uh, DeepMind, Google's DeepMind, they're using it for self-driving car research, computer vision, and natural language processing research. So I guess just to humor all of you, uh, a South Korean farmer, his son was a software engineer. He used TensorFlow to create a cucumber classification model. So in like the, in like the farm, whenever cucumbers from the farm, they were bought into, into the warehouse, the classifier would uh, predict what class of cucumbers it would belong to. And you know, there would be like the sweeper thing that kind of sweeps it into its uh, uh, specific bucket. So yeah, even you know, farms, agri-tech, you know, TensorFlow is big in that. So yeah, uh, TensorFlow, its usage is it's really just constrained by your imagination, what you want to use it for. So TensorFlow, while you know it, it has its merits, we you know why specifically do companies use TensorFlow? Why does a single developer use TensorFlow? TensorFlow is kind of like this huge ecosystem of uh, of, of many different uh, uh, products. Uh, that enable you to do different things. So on one hand, it lets you build simple uh, data pipelines. It lets you ingest data, load, pre-process all of them. It lets you build and reuse neural network models. It uh, lets you take those uh, trained models when you freeze their weights and you kind of put them into production. Uh, you can use TensorFlow for that. And you can even visualize your training process uh, using some dashboard, using a dashboard that TensorFlow provides. It's fully open source, and you can do all of this without paying a single dollar. And TensorFlow even allows you to train on specialized hardware that Google built themselves. Uh, so the entire ecosystem and the infrastructure is provided by uh, the Google TensorFlow team so that you can do anything you want with it. So. Uh, if, you're if you're here for the talk or you're tuning in online, I'm guessing that uh, you are here for one of these purposes. You want to learn TensorFlow for projects, you want to apply it at work, or you, would, you just want to learn something new and exciting uh, that's highly in demand nowadays. Uh, and you, or you just, uh, you know, you're a student educator wanting to pick up this for your school projects. So by the end of this, uh, I want to assure you that this workshop will be, will be covering a bit of basic TensorFlow, and that should get you uh, up and running uh, for whatever you want to do beyond this. All right, so the TensorFlow API, it's really simple to learn. Uh, for me, it took a few weeks to get started with it. There are some highly complicated machine learning frameworks out there that require even more time and expertise to get used to the syntax. But TensorFlow, it's really Pythonic. So if you're familiar with Python, you can easily get started with TensorFlow and you, know, you can hit the ground running. It's as simple as that. And neural networks, all that math and that complexity, underlying complexity, TensorFlow abstracts all of that away such that you 
can build your entire data pipeline, you know, loading your data set, training your model, checking performance metrics, and you know, deploying that well within you know, 20 to 30 lines of code. And you know, when you compare that to like, the number of lines of code that organizations or corporations write, 20 to 30 lines is nothing. So TensorFlow allows you to do all that really easily. And TensorFlow, it's, uh, you know, you can, it's fully customizable. While they also provide, while they provide some basic functions for, I guess, beginners to use, you can also customize it for your own uh, personal use case. You can create custom layers. You can create uh, custom input pipelines. You can do all of that for both beginners and advanced users with TensorFlow. So what TensorFlow does is when you're creating that, uh, when you're creating that neural network, when you're you know specifying each layer one by one. Uh, what it's doing in, I guess, the background at a low level is it's creating this thing called the computation graph. The computation graph is simply uh, an organized view of all the processes occurring in your entire pipeline. So the computation graph, it consists of uh, nodes and edges. Each node, uh, well, it pertains to a specific operation or data value that uh, is being given to it. Uh, and an edge is basically that flow of data or that operation being con uh, performed on that variable. Yeah, so for example, you know, say we have this uh, multivariate function fxy equals y plus 2 plus x square y. So if we were to break this down or we give this to something like TensorFlow, it constructs a computation graph with this equation. So to help you visualize this, let's imagine that same fxy function, and we want to build the computation graph for it. So we take y and the constant 2, and we take x. And we get x square by multiplying x with itself. The, the yellow circle that you see there, it represents the multiplication operation. And the squares that you see, it represents the data value that's going in, either a variable or a constant, like, like two. So now that we have all the basic building blocks, the variables, uh, x square, y, and two, we want to all bring them together to form that fxy equation. So now, when you have x square, y, and two, you can multiply x square and y to, to get x square, y. At the same time, you can take the same value of y and add it to 2 to get y plus 2. And finally, the last operation in this computation graph, uh, to top it all off, it adds both these things together, the y plus 2, the y plus 2 part of it, and the x, x square y part of it. It adds both of them together to form that final equation, uh, fxy, or that expression. So at a high level, this is what a computation graph is. We have a really complicated, I guess, equation. We break it up into, into its individual steps to simplify the problem while also ensuring that we finally get to that equation at the end or that process. We finish it uh, in a very organized method. So TensorFlow, uh, back when it was in its beta development, uh, there's an engineer, his name is uh, Francois Chalet. Yeah, my bad, I uh, forgot. Uh, yeah, uh, Francois Chalet, uh, follow him on Twitter, you should too. Uh, he's really active and he gives lots of good advice when it comes to machine learning. Uh, so he created this thing called Keras. Keras is, so if you think high, TensorFlow is at this level of abstraction at you know taking away all the ugly math underneath, Keras was in like a layer above that, so it was even more it was uh, even more I guess easier to use Keras than it was to use TensorFlow uh, back then. So, for uh, so in TensorFlow Beta, when you were, were to I guess initialize or create a neural network, you had to also initialize the individual weights and biases or the parameters manually. So you actually had to write W equals B equals for all the layers that you had in your network. But Kara, and naturally this took you know, 50 plus lines of code. And for anyone who didn't have that kind of time or for beginners trying to, I guess, quickly prototype, this was, I guess, e still too complicated for them. 
So uh, to remove all that, to push all that aside, uh, Francois, he created Keras. So you could do this same thing. You no longer had to initialize your weights, biases, parameters, hyperparameters. You no longer had to initialize any of that. All you had to do was call a specific function and it would do all of that. And your entire pipeline, whatever took you that 50 lines of code in TensorFlow, you could do the same thing in t less than 20 lines of code using Keras. So since then, uh, you know, as, as the Keras community, as the Keras project and the TensorFlow project, as they've grown, you know, the couple of years, uh, Keras is now part of TensorFlow. So using the TF or TensorFlow.Keras package, uh, you can get access to those functions available in Keras that abstract away everything. So now almost all the models that you see uh, on GitHub, open source, all the tutorials you use, uh, even TensorFlow version 2.0, it's fully based on the Keras spec, meaning you no longer have to do these low level operations to get your job done. You can use the high level uh, TF Keras library and do the same thing. So TensorFlow Keras, it has this thing called the Layers API. So what the Layers API does is it provides uh, a bunch of different functions or different classes that represent all these different layers. So earlier in the slides, we mentioned uh, you know, the fu fully connected layer, the convolutional layer, max pooling layer. So to actually implement that in raw NumPy, if you've heard of that, the numerical computing library in Python, if you were to use pure NumPy to write all of that, it would be a mess. But in tfkeras.layers, all you have to call a fully connected layer, you just need to write the word dense. So dense is just another name for fully connected. So you, all you need to do is type in dense and pass in a bit of parameters and you're good to go. You no longer have to initialize the weights, the parameters, or the hyperparameters. Or if you wanted to initialize a convolutional layer, all you have to do is type in conv2d, and it gets the job done. So the layers API, so all these di uh, different layers, if you were to bring them together to create the neural network architecture, you have to use this thing called the sequential API. So all of this is part of TF Keras. So sequential, you can think of it as like a bucket and all your layers are, I guess, the individual objects that you put in your bucket in an organized way. So now that I have my container, I put in you know, all my layer objects, one on top of each other. I stack them up to create my neural network. And with you know, less than seven lines of code, if you're creating a simple neural network, you have a, an architecture that you can train or do whatever you want with it. And each of these layers, data automatically flows between them, so you no longer have to specify connections between the layers like you had to do in uh, you know, the original version of TensorFlow. So yeah, TensorFlow, ever since its debut in early 2015, all the way till now, the ecosystem has grown so much. It has a lot of, uh, I guess, subsystems or sub-modules that the, the ecosystem has provided to make all your machine learning needs uh, much easier to acquire or achieve. So now, uh, now that we've done like a quick recap of the past, I guess, yeah, four to five years of TensorFlow and what and the contribution it has made to the machine learning community, uh, I guess it's time to finally do a bit of live coding. So uh, if you have your laptops, uh, please ensure that it's connected to the Wi-Fi. Uh, if not, no, I can, uh, are you connected to the Wi-Fi? Uh, Wi-Fi, okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll be doing a bit of live coding. So uh, who's heard of Google Colab? Uh, ra raise your hand if you've heard of Colab. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So Colab, uh, to those of you who, do, uh, who haven't heard of it, it's an online notebook. It's similar to Jupyter, but it's hosted on the web. So in the case that you want to quickly experiment with things, you can quickly hop on to a, a Google Colab notebook and immediately get started with, with coding. So the advantages of you know, using Colab compared to you know, having uh, an IDE or uh, having uh, you know, your specialized uh, editor or, or setup environment is that uh, Colab, it has, it, you know, it, 
it comes pre-packaged with uh, all the major data science and machine learning packages. You know, it comes with TensorFlow, TensorBoard, uh, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib. It has support for all of them, so you no longer have to install all of them. Because there are some issues that people have faced that, uh, you know, they're trying to install a package for doing machine learning projects, and it just fails. The installation fails. To, I guess, so to do away with all of that, you get this containerized uh, uh, notebook in your hand that you can do the same thing with. So Colab, an additional benefit is if uh, you do not want to spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a custom machine learning uh, rig, you can use the, uh, the hosted uh, virtual machines given by Colab. You have, uh, you know, you have your basic CPUs, you have the, uh, the, you have the Tesla GPUs, and you even have access to uh, the, the Google Brain team's custom hardware called the Tensor Processing Unit, or the TPU. You can get all access to all of that free of cost for 12 hours uh, using Colab. But if you want to, uh, I guess, uh, opt in for better virtual machines, or you want uh, more training time, uh, you know, up to like a day, 24 hours, uh, you can sign up for the Pro uh, version. It's uh, $10 per month, and uh, you have even more support for all your machine learning projects. And creating a Google Colab notebook is as simple as creating a Google Doc. So for that, we will be visiting Google Drive. So if all of you can visit drive.google.com on your browsers right now. Uh, hold on, let me zoom in. Yeah, and yeah, so once you're in Google Drive, you can log in with your Gmail account or your Google account, and you can click the new button, and when you see more, you can, in the drop-down menu, uh, you can select Google Colab. And when you click it, it redirects you to another page, which is a fresh notebook for you. So yeah, it's as simple as creating a Google Doc. Uh, is there, does anyone uh, not see Google Colab in their, uh, uh, in that in that drop down menu, everyone's on Colab. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, ignore the, yeah. Oh, uh, so uh, can you access Colab? Uh, have you accessed Colab? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, never mind. Uh, sir, have you accessed? Okay, good. So you see something like this, right? Okay, yeah. So I'll give you like a quick. Uh, run through of Colab if oh yeah so this is like a like a custom thing you know while while I'm at it you know I can I can show you uh, you know just for I guess the banter you can uh, go to uh, you can go to tools settings uh, miscellaneous and you can select one of these uh, funky little animations that's going to start appearing uh, I will disable this option because it's pretty distracting uh, but you know feel free to yeah, enable that. All right, so this is like a quick uh, run through in, uh, for Colab. So this, I guess, black uh, rectangle you see, it's called a cell. Uh, but before we even start coding, there's this button called connect. Yeah, there's this button called connect. Uh, uh, can you try connecting? Yeah, so when you click connect, it's gonna say it's uh, you know allocating uh, the VM, and after that, uh, it's gonna show some basic uh, uh, basic metrics like RAM usage. Yeah, it should say connected, and it should show you, uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Is everyone connected? Okay, good. Yeah, so that means that our notebook right now, it's now, uh, it's now sitting on top of that VM. We can finally start coding. Uh, so yeah, so this black rectangle that you see here with this play button, it's called a cell. And whatever you type in this cell, you know, you can type, so Colab here, it's, it's a Python notebook, so you can only code in Python here. So if I can type in something like, uh, you know, x equals five, simple Python, and if I do y equals five, and I do x plus y, and if I were to click this play button, it's gonna run the Python specifically in that cell. And if you want, you can create more cells and you can, you can do even more with that. Okay, 
So notice how in my second cell, I do not have, or I haven't initialized the variable x. I only did it in the top cell. The, I guess the best thing about notebooks is that for every cell you create, it has a memory log of all the past variables you declared, or all the past actions that you've done in the, in the cells above. So you don't need to keep uh, reinitializing variables. So over here, I only initialize the variable z. And when I add x plus z, it takes the value of x from the previous cell and adds it to the value of z that I initialized here. Uh, so there's this button called code. So when you click code, uh, yeah. But also if you hover at, uh, over the bottom of like a, a pre-existing cell, you get this thing called code in text. You can click code. And you know, if you want to create uh, notebooks that you want to publicly release for, I guess, your own notes, or uh, you know, you want to create like a tutorial using a Colab notebook, you can click the text button. And this, it's you know, just it's just a bunch of you know basic text, and you know, it appears over here. And below, for for example, this text, I could say this is like a description of what I'll be doing in the in the cell below, and yeah, comments. But at the same time, you can, uh, you can write some good descriptions of what you're going to do in the cell or like the entire project. So yeah, this is Colab in a nutshell. Uh, if you are using Mac OS and you want a shortcut, you don't want to keep pressing this run button or this play button, you can do command enter and it'll run the cell. If you're on Windows, it's control enter or shift enter. You can try one of them. It should run the specific cell. Yeah. So. Uh, it should also be this, it depends on the keyboard you have. If you have a command key, then it's command enter. If you have a control key, it's control enter or shift enter. You can try one of them. Is running? All right, so now that we have created, so yeah, to delete a cell, you can hover over the cell, there's this trash icon, you can click, it'll delete the cell. All right, shift enter, shift enter, okay. All right, so now that we are here, uh, yeah, so we've done like a quick tour of Colab. So now, uh, now we're actually gonna be using TensorFlow from scratch. Uh, so. Before we begin building models with TensorFlow, we first need a data set to work with. So TensorFlow data sets, or when you write it in code, TFDS, uh, it, it comes with a whole bunch of data sets, you know, over 150 data sets uh, that, you know, it's in different categories like text, uh, text, audio, video, uh, summarization tasks. You can have access to all of that using TFDS, or TensorFlow datasets. So I guess when we go back to the, to the notebook, uh, we can import TensorFlow, of course. But before that, we can import the numerical computing library NumPy. And then we can import TensorFlow as TF. Uh, so yeah, the as tf or as np, it's just a shorthand notation uh, in Python. So you don't need to like type in TensorFlow, you know, every time you type, every, every time you want to use something from it, you can say tf dot and it'll mean the same thing. So yeah, so we have import TensorFlow as tf. And now finally let's import, let me just uh, increase this, okay. We can import TensorFlow uh, data sets as TFDS. So in Colab, it also has this autocomplete uh, feature as you would have seen, you know, when I'm typing, there's a drop down menu of all the different uh, options that the Colab environment provides. So when you're, as you're typing, you can tab complete uh, that specific line. Okay, so now we can run this cell. Actually, before this, uh, the current version of Colab, it's, uh, wait, let me check the TensorFlow version. 
So yeah, uh, if you type tf.version and you run that specific cell, if you see 1.15, uh, that's not the version we're using. Uh, can you can you try typing tf.version, see what version your notebook is on? Because if it's all on 1.15, we'll have to convert it to the 2.x because that's the, the most recent configuration or release of Python, the stable release. Uh, do you see something like 1.15? Okay, yeah, so uh, we're not going to be using 1.15. 1.15 is the, I guess, the older version. Uh, the most recent version is 2.21. Uh, uh, yeah, so to upgrade TensorFlow in Colab, uh, we'll have to, uh, you know, re we have to rerun the, we need to restart the VM by, uh, you know, by invoking the, the 2.x package. So if you want to use TensorFlow 2.x, 2. 2. you need to type uh, uh, the percentage sign, uh, TensorFlow underscore version space 2.x. Oh yeah, when you, when you hover above, so if I have a cell below and I hover on top, there'll be a code button that comes up. If you click it, it'll create a cell above. Or you can create, a, a, alternatively, you can create another code cell here, and you can see this arrow button on the top, and it lets you move your cell up and down. Like the arrows here, like I can move the cell up and down. Yeah. Uh, any issues so far? Oh, the arrows don't work? Oh, the up one, uh, it's only grayed out if it's at like the top of the notebook. Uh, is everything okay on the set? Yeah, uh, percentage TensorFlow underscore version space 2.x. Yeah, if you want to use the most recent version of TensorFlow, because the Colab notebooks, up until now, they haven't been updated to 2.x. All of them, they're still running 1.15. So if you really want to use like the latest version, you need to specify it on your own at the top. So now that we've kind of found out that we're using the wrong version of TensorFlow, we need to restart this virtual machine. So if you go to this, this runtime option at the top, and you click restart and run all. It'll uh, it'll give you this pop up. When you click yes, uh, you know it's reconnecting, reallocating space. Uh, it's uh, booting up that VM, and uh, when it starts running, yeah, finally, uh, you know it says that two uh, dot x selected. Yeah, everyone good? Okay, uh, on the side. Okay. Uh, all right, so now that we are using 2.x, we have imported all of this. Uh, we can go back to the slides. All right, so now that we have imported NumPy, the numerical computing library, TensorFlow, uh, which is what we're gonna use for the majority of you know, the neural network construction and the pipeline, and you know, TFDS, TensorFlow datasets, uh, the next thing we'd want to move on in terms of the, the concepts is TensorFlow models. So to build a model or to build a neural network, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you need to use the sequential API. So sequential, you can think of it as a container, and one by one, you put your layers one on top of each other to create the entire model or neural network. So when you know, when Keras was, you know, uh, was finally under TensorFlow, the models, uh, sub, the models uh, sub-module, it came with, uh, you know, automatic support for, you know, training, testing. Uh, it came with support for your loss functions, optimizers. So you no longer have to write all of that from scratch. So 
using your TensorFlow uh, data sets, TFDS data sets, you can uh, train them, you can train the TensorFlow model on these data sets. So when you have a model, you, it's basically, it consists of layers. So tf.keras.layers, the layers API module, it comes with all these, you know, some of these common um, layers, you know, input for you know, taking in uh, an input, taking in that X value. Uh, dense, which is basically a, a synonym for a fully connected layer. Uh, activation, which uh, you either have an option to type in the activation function in the dense block, or you can specify a new layer called the activation layer and type in uh, that specific function there. Uh, we'll see more of that later. So COM2D, it's your 2D convolution layer. Uh, max pool 2D is your maximum pooling uh, uh, in two-dimensional space. Flatten is that thing that take, uh, takes in an n-dimensional uh, matrix and squashes it into a vector. And reshape uh, is a special layer. Uh, so when your uh, when your input layer takes in uh, an n-dimensional matrix, your reshape layer uh, well it it's pretty self-explanatory. It reshapes that incoming vector into a target shape. So if I have a 28 by 28 image going in, but I only want a uh, a 780. So 28 by 28 is 784 right, when you multiply them. So I have a 28 by 28 pixel image going into my pipeline, right, using the input layer. So immediately when you put a reshape layer under that and you type in 784, it'll take that 28 by 28 and squash it. So in a way you can think of your reshape layer as kind of like a sub, as a subcategory of flatten because even a flatten takes in something and changes its shape. So yeah, when you're building some basic neural networks, these are the common layers that are used. Uh, there are much more. Uh, so instead of max pool, you can use your global average pooling layers. Uh, you also have 1D convolutions, 3D convolutions. Uh, and you have a bunch of other layers like your attention layer, but we're not gonna be covering that to uh, keep this tutorial simple. So as, uh, I guess, to get, our, uh, get ourselves comfortable with the TensorFlow syntax, the TFDS API, uh, we'll be training on this data set called MNIST. Uh, who's heard of MNIST? So MNIST is this uh, a 28 by 28 image hand-drawn digits data, data set. So it has hand-drawn digits from, you know, from zero all the way to nine. So you can see an example of both of them. Uh, they're all 28, pixel, 28 by 28 pixels. Uh, that's you know an eight, and that's a zero. So since uh, they are in, uh, you know they're grayscale images, you can flip the color map. So you can either present it as you know the digit is black and like the background is white, or the other way around uh, in the case of zero. So this is what we're going to do now. We're going to take in this entire MNIST data set. We're going to uh, build a really simple neural network to train on this data set and classify hand hand drawn digits. All right. Okay, so now that we have that, okay, I'm just going to take a seat here. Okay, so now that we imported the numerical computing library TensorFlow and TensorFlow datasets, we finally want to go ahead and load our dataset. So I'm just going to call this dataset train or DS train as tfds.load. And I just need to type in MNIST over here. So earlier I mentioned that uh, TensorFlow datasets has a, I guess, a repository or a collection of like various datasets that are at your disposal. All you need to do is type in the name, the specific name of the dataset, and you have it in your hands. So tfds.load, it takes in the entire dataset and it, uh, I guess, dumps it into the DS train variable. But here, since we're only creating the training set, we can specify the split that we want. So here, the split refers to uh, which part of the data set we want. Do we want the training set or do we want the testing set? So here, we can specify the split to be train. So this just gives, so MNIST, the MNIST data set, uh, yeah. 
So the MNIST dataset, it consists of 60,000 training images and 10,000 testing images. Uh, so we only want that first 60,000 images in the dataset. So that's why we specify the train split. So I also mentioned that supervised learning is a branch of machine learning or category of machine learning where you give the model both the features and the labels. So as supervised is basically a Boolean, you just need to give, you need to say true, and it'll give you both the features, which is basically the 28 by 28 pixels, and it'll also give you the class label, you know, does it, you know, zero to nine, which category it belongs to. So now that we have this, we can finally uh, run this cell. Let me just minimize this, okay, yeah. So what it's gonna do is, is it's, it'll download the entire data set from uh, Google Cloud Storage, so there's a publicly available or accessible uh, URL. So it pulls that thing, pulls the entire data set or the training data set from that URL. So now, now that we have the training data set in our hands, uh, let's visualize you know, what the individual instances look like. So we can say, uh, you know, let's iterate through, I guess, uh, four examples and uh, let's uh, visualize them. But before we iterate, we want to uh, import matplotlib, which is the visualization library. So in my autocomplete uh, menu, uh, matplotlib.pyplot as PLT, when you, uh, it'll autocomplete this. So PLT is the visualization package. It lets you draw graphs, uh, histograms, uh, figures, sketches, anything, images, anything. So now that we have uh, PLT, we can finally uh, iterate through the training data set DS train. So DS train is, uh, so the class it belongs to is the uh, data set builder class uh, in the TensorFlow ecosystem or the TensorFlow library. So it comes with this specific function called take. So from my entire 60,000 uh, image data set, I want to take a part of it. And you need to specify n, which is how many you want to take. So say out of six, 60,000, I want to take the first three. So I, I type in dstrain.take3. Right? So now uh, we're going iter to iterate through the first three training instances. So image dot label, sorry, uh, image comma label, uh, it's going to be stored in this example variable over here. Yeah, in this example variable over here. So example, example is just an array with uh, two elements. Example at the first, at the zero at index uh, is the image. And example in the first index is your label, you know, as in like, you know, zero to nine, which one it belongs to. So TensorFlow, it has its own custom uh, uh, data type called a tensor. And you can't access tensors on its own. Uh, you need to take its NumPy representation for both of them. So at the end of example, uh, at the zero index, we can type in dot NumPy uh, for both of them, and this gives us the NumPy version or the NumPy representation of the image and the label. And uh, matplotlib or PLT, it's only able to visualize uh, NumPy arrays, not tensors. So that's why, that's another reason why we want to convert it. So now that we have loaded a single image and label from that example instance, we can finally uh, visualize it. Yeah, so we can say uh, plt dot uh, image, and we can even uh, add a title to each uh, visualization as the label. So. What you'll see here pretty quickly is that uh, when you create a plot, uh, whatever it represents, you can add a title to that. You can even label the axes, uh, the X and Y axes. So now that we have this, let me zoom out for a bit. 
you when you run this cell, it'll give you an error, uh, which is 28 by 28 comma one is an invalid shape. So PLT, it only takes in uh, two dimensional images. And since MNIST is a grayscale image, it should only have three channels. So uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the RGB uh, concept. So grayscale images, they only have uh, two dimensions, while RGB images, colored images, they have three dimensions, one for each RGB channel. Which is why this image, we'll have to use the NumPy operator uh, dot reshape. So let me zoom back in. So when we say plt dot uh, image, we want to add the dot reshape such that we want to reshape it to 28 by 28. Uh, everyone uh, up to speed? Okay. Oh, you just need to click the click the cell. You. Oh uh, yeah. So the when you're hosted on the the CPU runtime, uh, it uses your local CPU. So if your device is slow, uh, naturally, Colab may also take a while to uh, run each cell or uh, perform operations. Uh, we want to, okay, so originally the, the NumPy representation from that tensor that we get, uh, it's 28 by 28 by one, but PLT only takes in two dimensional images. This one is three dimensional. It has one, two, and three dimensions. But over here, we just want the first two dimensions. And since that last one is just one, we can completely cut it off uh, without affecting anything. 28 by 28, yeah. So yeah, when you hover over the reshape, uh, the word reshape, it says that it's a built-in method in uh, from NumPy. So all these tensors, when you get their NumPy representation, anything you can do with NumPy, you can do it on them. So yeah, when you run this cell, yeah, it finally gives you this. Uh, does everyone see digits? Yeah, so four is the first uh, training instance in, in the MNIST data set. So when you zoom into this, we can see, you know, the title. Over here, we gave the, we wanted to also add the title for each plot. Over here, you can see that uh, uh, for each image, it has its corresponding label, which is the title. Okay, so now that we have our training data set, we wanna, we wanna pre-process it such that uh, we can finally feed it into the network that we'll be building soon. So for that, uh, TFDS, TensorFlow datasets, comes with many pre-processing, uh, built-in pre-processing methods and functions that uh, all you need to do is call the function and uh, or call that method and it'll perform that step or that operation on your data set. So now what we're gonna do is all this raw uh, DS train data set that we have, we want to batch it so that we can train the, the model in batches. And we also want to fit the, fit the we, want, we want to shuffle the data set so that uh, you know, the data set isn't really predictable. Uh, and also, we want to fit the entire thing into the memory of our virtual machine, our hosted virtual machine. So we're going to do all that in this cell now. So DS train. But before that, we first need to normalize the data set. So normalization, it basically means uh, when your data set, all the individual features, or in this case, all the different pixels, they're going to be in the 0 to 255 range because in the RGB uh, channels, it ranges from 0 to 255. 255 being the highest in intensity for that channel, 0 being the minimum. So here, we want to normalize it into a range between uh, 0 and 1. 
because if you have in machine learning or uh, when you're building or training models, when you have too large a number, uh, there's a chance that uh, the data set will overflow because the numbers are becoming too, too huge. So the more that you work with decimal numbers, really small numbers, the better. So normalize, it takes in you know, the images or you know, the, the, pixel, the pixel values, and it also takes in the, the labels. So what we want to do is first we want to return back the images, but uh, we want to divide each pixel by 255. But 255, it's an integer value, but the images, they are in an other data type representation. So they are in the uint8 data type representation. We want to convert them into float32. So to do that, we can say tf dot cast. So when you have an integer and you want its string representation, you kind of cast it writing str brackets and that integer inside. It'll give you the same but in string format. Similarly, we want to cast the uint8 representation and we want to change all of that into float32. So we can say we want to cast the, all the images that's given to this function into the tf dot float32 uh, data type representation. And now that we have uh, uh, converted it into a, a format that we can work with, we can finally divide it by 255. So when you take a large number, or a number between 0 and 255, and you divide it by 255, you squash it into the range 0 to 1. So here we have ca uh, casted the images to float32, and we can now divide, uh, divide it by 255, and we can also return the, the labels and just run the, run the cell. So notice here that when you type, when you write in a function in a collab cell, it doesn't run the function because you never called it. It just exists. So now let's pre-process the DS train data set. So DS train equals DS train dot map. So what dot map does is it takes in a mapping function and it applies that function to every single uh, instance that exists within the data set. So for all the images, we want to apply this normalized function that we wrote above, and we want to apply it to all the images. And at the same time, we want to do it in such a way that it's all inside the memory of your, of your machine. So we want to type in this thing called, the, this parameter called the num parallel calls. As you're typing, it should, uh, it should autocomplete. Yeah, and you should get this, uh, num underscore parallel underscore calls. So we had to type in this thing called tf.data.experimental.autotune. So this entire thing, it seems like a mouthful, but all it's doing is it's taking that entire huge data set and it's uh, fitting it into your machine so that you don't get any out of memory errors. So all it's doing is it's caching it in your machine so you don't run into any errors downstream. So now that we have normalized the data set, we now want to batch up the data set. So we can say DS train equals DS train dot batch. So all the, all the 60,000 images that are in the data set now, it's gonna break, it's gonna uh, convert it into batches of 32. Yeah, so it converts it into uh, blocks of 32 images. So there have been many machine learning papers that have come out uh, a while back on why batching your data set helps the neural network train better. It's, uh, I guess you could call it, uh, like a good practice to do. So whenever you are, instead of training on the entire data set, you train on batches of it so that the model can generalize well. So now that we have batched up the data set, we now want to shuffle it so as to make it uh, you know, a bit more random. 
uh, something that the network can't uh, really, it's not predictable, predictable basically. So you keep giving it random instances to train on. So for that, we want to type in dstrain.shuffle. And inside this shuffle function, let me zoom in. Yeah, inside this shuffle function, uh, we want to type in the size of the, of the data set. So we type in 60,000 here because we have 60,000 images in the data set. But if you're using this on a data set with 10,000 10, images, you want to type in 10,000 instead of 60,000. So now what this shuffle function does is it randomly samples from your data set and keeps giving random uh, training instances for the model. So now, again, we want to do this in a very memory efficient manner. So we type in ds.train.com prefetch. So prefetch is uh, another TensorFlow dataset method that when you apply it to your dataset, uh, it loads it into memory really efficiently. And we want to use the same strategy that we used up here. So over here, we use the auto-tune. So it does everything automatically. We don't need to do, we don't need to put in any more effort into uh, loading and processing the dataset in memory. So in the prefetch, uh, method, we again, we can type in tf.data uh, dot experimental dot autotune. Again, your autocomplete, if it's enabled on your Colab notebook, it should autocomplete this. So has everyone reached until this prefetch point? Just give me a thumbs up when you're uh, finished typing. Yeah, we can run this code and we have, you know, we've completed processing our training data set. And now we have to do the same thing for our testing data set. And to do that, we can create a new cell. We can say DS test. By the way, if you ever run into any errors, just, uh, just you know, uh, raise your hand or you know, just call out uh, because in TensorFlow, many errors are usually caused by uh, uh, internal virtual machine errors. Like it's not your fault, it, ju it just happens. So yeah, if you run the cell again, it should clear up. Un unless it's like a typo or something, which uh, means yeah, you need to like uh, cross ver uh, verify with the code on, on the screen. So yeah, now that we have finished pre-processing our training data set, we have to do the same thing for our testing data set. And it's a similar process, TFDS, tfds.load, again, we want the MNIST data set, but this time, it, for the split, we want the testing data set. We want the testing data set, you know, we need the test data set. Uh, again, we need it as supervised, as true, so it's gonna give us everything. It's gonna give us both the features and the labels. So now that we have loaded in our testing data set, you know, we can just go ahead and run this cell. It shouldn't give any errors. And now we can finally start pre-processing our testing set. So it's a similar process. Actually, we can take this, in, uh, this cell, copy everything, and paste it down here. And instead of DS train, we have, uh, we have to change it to DS test everywhere. And we can, so this DS test dot shuffle, we can completely remove that line because we don't really need to shuffle our testing data set because it's already, uh, it already contains instances the model has not seen before. But yes, we do want to batch it uh, because it's, it's uh, working in batches, it's much faster than processing the entire data set at a shot. Again, you see over here that we're using the map function or the map method provided by TensorFlow datasets, and we apply the normalize function on all the instances. And when you run the cell, you know, it shouldn't give you any errors. Okay, just give me a thumbs up when you've uh, finished the prefetch function.
Okay, so uh, for like the online viewers, the question is why aren't we shuffling the testing data set? Uh, we're not shuffling it. We, 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 okay, first let me explain why we want to shuffle our training data set. We shuffle it because we want to be fully random. We want to keep giving it random instances uh, when training so that it doesn't, uh, I guess, find patterns in the data set itself saying that, um, you know, I'm going to get this instance next for training. So, uh, which is why we shuffle it. So, uh, similar way, so if I have a deck of cards and I want to, uh, when I'm playing a game of cards, I shuffle the deck first before, you know, giving it out to each of the players. So that, uh, that way, there's a fully random chance of getting that card. Instead, you know, th there's no chance of, I guess, cheating, or in this case, the model cheating or learning something uh, that it's not supposed to learn. So, yeah. But for testing, we don't really need to shuffle it because the testing uh, data set, it contains uh, the training instances, the images that the model has never seen before. So yeah, that's why we don't need to shuffle it. It's already random enough. Yeah, remove, uh, you can remove shuffle from the testing data set, but you want to keep it for the training data set to keep the training fair. Yeah, just run the code. It shouldn't give you any errors. Okay, good. Okay, so now that we have uh, loaded in and pre-processed our training and testing data sets, we can finally start building the model, right? So for this, the tf.keras.layers uh, library, it abstracts away all the math and the compli all the complicated uh, theory that you need to know when you're creating uh, neural networks. You no longer have to initialize your individual neurons. You don't need to uh, uh, instantiate your parameters or hyperparameters. All of it is done in the background. So now let's go ahead and import some more, uh, import our model, or the sequential uh, API. And let's go ahead and download some, uh, sorry, uh, call some uh, of the layers that I mentioned. So in this specific MNIST example, we'll be using the uh, input layer, we'll be using the reshape layer, and uh, the dense layer, and the activation layer. So these four, we can qu uh, quickly build a neural network in you know less than 10 lines of code. So to use it, we have to say from tensorflow.keras.models, Import uh, sequential. Yeah, it should autocomplete. Yeah, so sequential, again, uh, just to recap sequential, you can think of it as a cardboard box, and everything that we're putting inside is basically, I guess, a food packet. So yeah, it's a container that contains uh, the, e uh, like the individual layers connected together in the background. So now that we have sequential, we want to go ahead and import our layers. So for that, from tensorflow.keras.layers. So this is the layers API that was, uh, you know, that was shown in the slides earlier. So from here, we want to import the input layer. We want to import reshape. We want to import dense, which is basically another name for a fully connected layer. And we want to, uh, import the activation layer. So here, uh, earlier I mentioned that you don't really need the activation layer. You, there's a parameter in your dense layer called activation that you can just type in. But for the sake of visualizing the computation graph that we're building, uh, I wanted to add in the activation function for, uh, I guess, ease of understanding as to how TensorFlow goes about building that graph. So let's run this cell. Shouldn't, again, shouldn't give any errors. So we can say model equals sequential. So here we're initializing our container, our box that we're going to dump all the layers into. So yeah, model equals sequential. And to add uh, an individual layer into this box or sequential container, all we have to do is type model.add. It's as simple as that. Uh, you, ju you just need to go on, you know, adding different layers one after the other. So first, we're going to add in my input layer to take in, uh, well, the different, uh, the x values or the pixel values that I'm going to be feeding it. 
So, of course, input, it needs your target shape. And over here, we noticed, like, we got an error up above here saying that the image that we received, it's 28 by 28 by 1. So similarly here, we want to type in the, the dimensions or the yeah, dimensions or size of one single image. So MNIST images, it consists of uh, 28 by 28 images. So yeah, it's going to take in that uh, matrix over here. Next, we'll be using the reshape layer to take in this 28 by 28 by 1 matrix. And we're going to squash everything down into uh, 784. Yeah. So all it does is it takes that square and it just gives you a single row when you reshape it into 784. So this comma I added because, uh, so if you can see here, uh, I add this extra comma with nothing here. Yeah, because uh, when we work with this model, uh, it's kind of a way that we write it in NumPy to create vectors. Otherwise, it's just going to create another list. We don't want a list. We want a NumPy array. So if you add this comma, it's so much easier to work with NumPy arrays without having to work with uh, you know uh, really complicated dimensionalities and whatnot. So next, after we do that, we can finally go ahead and start building our uh, neural network or our feed-forward neural network. So we type in dense, which is just another name for fully connected. And as I mentioned, a fully connected layer is just a stack of neurons. So over here, as the first variable, uh, we want to type in the number of neurons in this layer. So you know, we can go ahead and I can type something like... Uh, 256. So in usually the best practice is working with uh, the uh, like neurons is uh, initializing it based on uh, multiples of 16. So 16, 32, uh, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Yeah, the usual. Uh, it's you know it's kind of like a best practice to use uh, to use one of those values as your neuron, as number of neurons, yeah? Uh, it's, it's best practice. Uh, like based on experiments, they found out that uh, using uh, that as the you know, number of neurons in a layer, it usually gives the, the best uh, generalization over a data set. All right, so next, after we add our dense layer, our fully connected layer, we want to add our activation layer. And activation over here, we can use something like the ReLU or a rectified linear unit uh, activation function. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not really getting into the math or like the individual concepts. Uh, you can uh, change this activation function to be anything. It could be the sigmoid activation function. It could be softmax. But usually softmax is reserved for the final output layer because it gives a probability distribution. Uh, pertaining to which class something would most likely belong to. So again, we want to add an other. We want to add another fully connected layer. So we type in dense again. So over here, uh, when you're going for neural networks, you want to have uh, kind of like a decreasing or tapering number of units all converging to like the number of classes that you have. So over here in this specific MNIST uh, case, we have 10 output classes corresponding to 0 till 9. So because of that, we want our final layer to have 10 neurons. So you know each one corresponding to 0 to 9. So 256, you know, next up we have 128. We want to taper it down. And similarly, uh, we want to have a ReLU activation function on it. And actually, we can, uh, you could just copy, hold on. We can just, we can just copy this, this block and just paste it down. So let me just add a bit of spaces so you can see. Yeah, so we have, this is a three-layer neural network. 
it consists of three fully connected layers, all of them having their own uh, uh, activation function. So here we can finally put something like 10 and, yeah, sorry? Oh yeah, it's 10 now. Uh, so depending on what uh, a depth you want your network to have, you know, we can, so in this case, this is a three layer neural network. Suppose I want a, a five layer neural network, all I need to do is add in two more dense layers or two more fully connected layers, each with their activation functions. But when it comes to the output layer, we want to have the soft max uh, activation function because it gives us a final probability distribution uh, pertaining to which class uh, an instance belongs to. So in all, all, out of all these 10 neurons, it's gonna, uh, so the index that it uh, fires the most at or it activates at, uh, it corresponds to the class it belongs to. So for example, if the third uh, neuron fires, then that means that it belongs to uh, you know, the number three or that, that digit, that handwritten digit, it corresponds to number three. But for example, if the eighth neuron has the highest probability in this distribution, it means that the number in the image is probably an eight. So yeah, we have this. So now we want to do this thing called uh, compiling a model. So compiling a model is, you know, is this uh, Keras term that you use. Uh, where you provide the loss function and the optimizer that you're going to use to train the network. So over here for the loss, we're going to be using a sparse categorical cross entropy. So all it does is it takes all my predictions, it compares it to all the actual labels, uh, and it computes a loss based on that. But additionally, you can also use the mean squared error loss or you know ab the mean uh, absolute error or uh, any activation function you can think of. So in the, in the official TensorFlow documentation, there's an entire list of all the loss functions that you can use. Uh, so yeah, you can search that up based on uh, if, you, if you want to explore. So over here, we want the sparse categorical cross entropy. So this could be anything. I'm just choosing uh, sparse categorical cross entropy as my uh, loss function but feel free to choose anything. But based on your loss function, it also affects the training. Different loss functions are known to have different, uh, I guess, training results. So for our optimizer, we want to choose the ADAM uh, optimizer. So ADAM stands for adaptive momentum. Uh, I don't want to get down to the math, but it's one of the best uh, optimizers out there today. So metrics is this thing that uh, all neural networks kind of have. So when you have, so these metrics are basically performance metrics. So over here, we want to maintain the accuracy or we want to check the accuracy of the network as it's training. So later you'll see when we're actually training on the data set, uh, yeah, when we're actually training on the data set, the accuracy is also printed uh, side by side. So you you know, if all goes well, you should see an increasing accuracy. So yeah, just give me a thumbs up after you finish this compile step on this side. Sorry? Yeah, just compile. So model.compile, and uh, you provide the loss, optimizer, and metrics. So all of these are, you need to specify them uh, because they're all the hyperparameters, like even the choice of loss function optimizer, they're hyperparameters that you choose beforehand. So yeah, and the metrics, uh, yeah, you need to have at least one metric other than the loss uh, to track during training. So yeah, just click this cell. Shouldn't give you any errors. Yeah. So now what I want to introduce, you know, before we start training, is this thing called a callback. So a callback is basically this thing that logs my training, uh, my, my training routine. So all the data associated with training, like the loss values, my accuracy values over my, you know, my training sequence, is gonna log all that and kind of store it in, in like a form of history. 
And a callback, what it does is uh, you can visualize the callbacks in this thing called TensorBoard. So TensorFlow, it comes with this, uh, this visualization called dashboard, as you can, uh, visualization dashboard, dashboard called TensorBoard, as you can see uh, you know, on, on the right side. So all these graphs that you see, they're all the different metrics that I'm trying to track. So by default, you track the uh, accuracy and the loss, but you can add in your own custom stuff. So yeah, TensorBoard, it allows you to uh, visualize your performance metrics during training, during testing, and it gives you the graphs to kind of see uh, you know, where I'm going wrong uh, what else I need to do to, I guess, bring my model back on the right track. So to use a callback, or to use the TensorBoard callback specifically, uh, we can import the TensorBoard callback uh, like so, tensorflow.keras.callbacks, import, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's TensorFlow, yeah, my bad. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, tensorflow.keras.callbacks, import the TensorBoard callback. So TensorBoard, uh, you can think of it as, suppose I'm running uh, uh, my 2.4, 2.4 km, and my friend is, you know, the guy timing me at the end of every lap. TensorBoard is that guy. So it basically logs everything. So when I'm running around the lap, when I'm running around the track, whenever I finish one lap, he's gonna scream out the timing, like, okay, you took uh, you know, two minutes to complete one lap. And he keeps uh, you know, screaming out the lap timings, the individual lap timings whenever I pass like that finish line again. So that's what TensorBoard does. As my model is training, you know, every epoch when it's training, it logs that, I guess, timing, but in this case, the loss and accuracy. It lo logs all of that information, and it displays that. So it's kind of, I guess, uh, it's synonymous to the, the timer person when you're running. So yeah, uh, we can, uh, my bad. Yeah, when we can run this cell, shouldn't give you any errors. Uh, so yeah, let's create our first callback. So TB, or you know, the TensorBoard callback, you can call this anything. TB equals TensorBoard. So it's asking for this thing called the log dir, which basically stands for my logging directory. So this is basically, uh, it's a directory where I want to store all my log files. So let's just say I want to store it in this folder called my logs. Yeah, let's just store it in my logs. And when we run this, again, sh no errors. So now that we have a callback, we can finally fit the model on the data set. Or in other terms, we can finally start training. So to train a, train a model on a data set, we have to, do, we have to write a model.fit. Uh, and remember the ds train variable from earlier? We just need to specify our training data set. Yeah, we have to specify the training data set. We have to specify the number of epochs that it's gonna train on. So for, I guess we're running low on time, so I'm just gonna specify, uh, well, I guess two epochs. It's not gonna give me much of an, uh, a performance boost, but uh, just to visualize what usually happens when training. After that, I'm gonna say validation data, it's gonna autocomplete, equals ds underscore test. So ds test from earlier, it's my, uh, uh, it's my testing data set. And finally, I want my timer. Right? I, want a ti I want that timer person to be there. So callbacks equals an array of all my call callbacks. So I can have as many callbacks as I want, and Keras has support for you know, over 10 different callbacks. But here, we're only using one. So we just need to specify an array for callbacks and just you know, type in TB, or you know, your callback here, into it. Yeah. TensorBoard, you specify your logging directory. I just call this my logs. You can call it anything. And 
you just need to fit the model. So again, you can just go ahead and click this. If you run into an error, it's probably because of some dimensionality issue. Uh, so to fix this, we have to go back all the way here. Yeah, so we had to go back all the way here and uh, reload all the cells uh, yeah, from this DS train onwards. So this one, again, it's more of a, it's like a TensorFlow error. It's, it's not an error on our part. All you need to do is reload the, reload the, da uh, the data set. Actually, over here, uh, in your DS train, you can actually say uh, download equals true. So that actually fully caches the entire data set in memory. So uh, we don't get those weird errors at the bottom. Oh, your model training is taking a long time. Have you start, Have you clicked that fit cell? Uh, are you still here? So I'm, I'm up all the way back where we started. Uh, uh, do you get this error? Or do you see, you know, something like a, like oh, so you see something, uh, oh, the play button, it's, yeah, that, that, oh, this play button over here. Okay, yeah, that, again, it depends on, I guess, the, the speed of your machine. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, okay, so we're using the CPU runtime. The CPU, it uses your local machine, but if you go for your GPU runtime, uh, which we'll be doing in the next, uh, next segment, the GPU runtime, it uses the hosted VM. So yeah, it connects your machine to a Tesla K8 GPU. Uh, again, since they're giving it out for free, you know, that you can't really complain much. Tesla uh, v, uh, K8, you know, uh, they're not that fancy, but you know, we had to make do if, you know, we uh, want to train free of cost. So, from here, for all the way from DS train where we first loaded it, we may need to run all these cells once again. Uh, yep. So again, when you just rerun all the cells, if you run into a dimensionality error, especially when you are uh, about, just about to train, just reload all the cells, restart your VM, and run all your cells. Uh, it's, you know, a TensorBot error. Oh, you, you, oh. oh, but do you see anything below that? Yeah, again, it, uh, it's based on your uh, machine's performance, your local machine's performance. Oh, so uh, uh, did, uh, on this side, uh, did you see the, the training happening? Okay, yeah, so in some cases you may see a message, some cases you might not, but do you get something that looks like this? Oh, so you see something moving? Okay, great. So technically you can even train up to, well, five epochs. Yeah, they're just, Yeah, so uh, over here in your DS train variable over here, you can set download equals true. So it's gonna pull everything that's there in that repository down to my machine so that I don't need to keep pulling it whenever I need to refer to it. So everything is now finally on my machine. Uh, I don't need to rely on anything else. And it's much faster when you download the data set. So yeah, in DS train, just download equals true. You don't need to do the same for testing. Yeah, you don't need to do that for testing because the testing data set is only like 10K images, so it, it's not that much effort. But 60K, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge number. All right, so you, you can exactly, yeah. So notebooks, it'll actually save all your things. It's, it's like creating a Google Doc, right? So when you type in something, when I close that browser, when I go back to my drive, it's there. Similarly, when you close a Colab notebook, you can access it in your drive. Yeah, and it'll actually like save all your outputs so you don't need to run everything again because there are some, I guess, training jobs that take, you know, 12 hours, right? I don't want to keep running that every day just because I closed my browser. 
At the same time, I don't want to keep my browser in my Chrome or like my browser or the tab in my browser because you know it, it looks m messy. So I can close it, come back, it'll retain all my all that information. So I guess that's another benefit of using Colab. All right. So you know, just just, uh, just yeah, yeah. So you can do uh, Command S or Control S. Yeah, and it'll, it'll it'll save it similar to what you do with Google Docs. It auto saves. Yeah, similarly, even Colab's auto save. Yeah, the Colab notebooks, uh, all of them auto save. Yeah, sh uh, even Docs it uh, auto saves. Actually, all the you know Sheets, Docs, uh, all uh, yeah, uh, Google Slides, all of them are auto save by default. But I guess for brevity's sake, you can keep yeah. Yeah, but if you want to manually save, you can do Command S or Control S. It'll like force save again. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess uh, I I changed this two to a five. So we're just training for five epochs instead of two. Uh, so yeah, we just need to wait for this training loop to end. Oh yeah, uh, so the the callbacks in general, not all of them are updated to 2.0, and not all of them are, you know, when you put them on a VM, they can run at the same, with the same performance. So that's why some of them may be too slow for your CPU clock. It'll give you the error, but you don't really need to worry. So, uh, so even like to the online viewers, if you have any errors, if you're running this, uh, right now, you can ignore any warnings uh, because most of the most of the warnings they're just because of some internal error with TensorBoard or TensorFlow, so you don't really need to care. You can just ignore all of them and just continue coding. They, they won't affect anything. It'll just train, yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, when you, wherever you are, when you close, when you close uh, a tab that contains a Colab notebook, or if the notebook is inactive for a really long time, like I haven't done anything to it for, I guess, like two hours, right? It'll automatically disconnect. Remember when we started, we clicked this uh, connect button that was here. It allocates the, the VM and it connects everything, and then you can start coding. Yeah. So if you don't use it, if it's idle for a long time, it'll disconnect. All you need to do is click that connect button again, and you can run all your cells. So actually, if you're uh, if you're lazy to run, you know, click keep clicking the play button. If you click runtime in your menu, you can just click run all. It'll just you know do a full sweep. So you don't need to keep clicking the play button. So you can do whatever you want, but in the background, the code is running. All right, so now that we have trained, uh, now that we have trained our model for five epochs, if you can see over here the accuracy, uh, you can see that on our testing set, the DS test, uh, we're reaching a 97.5 you know, accuracy, which is kind of huge, right? So that means out of all the 10,000 images, it got 97% of them correct, right? That's already about, 9.7k, uh, 9 yeah, so yeah. So this is your testing accuracy or validation accuracy, and this is your training accuracy. We got a 99 here and a 97 here. Uh, you can always, for most cases, you can always expect your uh, validation or testing accuracy to be slightly lower than your training accuracy because, again, these testing instances, we've never really fully seen them. Uh, or the model hasn't seen them, but it's seen everything in the training data set, uh, which is like it accounts for the discrepancy. All right, so now that we've finished training for five epochs and we have these you know, random numbers over here, we can finally visualize this entire thing in TensorBoard. So to invoke TensorBoard, and if you want to visualize it in Colab, uh, you can type in uh, the percent sign load underscore ext, which is basically load extension, uh, and you can type in TensorBoard over here.
Yeah. And you can run this cell. Yeah, shouldn't give any errors. So yeah, uh, percent sign load underscore ext space tensorboard. So that gives you control over using tensorboard. So now that we have, uh, I guess, imported tensorboard, we can finally visualize our training performance, all those metrics in tensorboard. So again, uh, exclamation sign, uh, tensorboard, it should autocomplete now. Uh, and for this, it wants a logging directory. So it's gonna search for that logging directory on my machine and it'll dig out all my log files from there. So over here, when in my TensorBoard callback, I said that I want my logging directory to be my logs. So over here, I just need to type in my underscore logs again. So what TensorBoard is gonna do is it's actually gonna go into that folder and just get all my training logs. So now if I can zoom out and so it'll say launching TensorBoard and that cell, uh, hold on. Yeah, it should be, I think it should, yeah, it's, uh, so over here it's just one direct word, L-O-G-D-I-R, there's no dash or underscore. All right, so you should see something like this, and this is TensorBoard. So does everyone see this, something like this? Yeah, just, just give it uh, some time to run. Yeah, can, can I know what error that is? What's it saying? Oh, uh, can you try uh, loading that extension again? On this side, uh, do you have TensorBoard? Uh, is TensorBoard running? So uh, I'm guessing you finished your training loop successfully. Uh, did you get any errors for training? Yeah, uh, so I think to speed things up, you can set the epochs to two and just quickly run that cell, the model.fit cell. Uh, do you see this? Oh, no worries, yeah. Uh, so just to recap, you need to type in uh, percent load underscore ext tensorboard. And when you run that, it's gonna invoke tensorboard uh, such that you can display it in your Colab notebook. And in your next cell, you can type percent tensorboard uh, and as a command line parameter, you can give it logdir, L-O-G-D-I-R, and specify the logging directory that you typed in over here with your tensorboard callback. And when you run that cell, uh, it should say launching tensorboard and it should, uh, it should show everything. Uh, so do you see something like this? Okay, yeah, so TensorBoard, it, it uh, takes a while to load because it uh, needs to build the, the UI. But I guess uh, we're running low on time here. It's already five. Uh, so uh, I'll give you like a quick recap or like a quick run through of TensorBoard on my screen up here. So TensorBoard, as you can see, uh, we it logs my training accuracy and my loss values. So over here, you can see a gradual increase in accuracy. You know, we're hitting up to, uh, you know, 99% uh, training accuracy. And uh, testing accuracy is about, you know, 97. And at the same time, when you see our loss values, when you're training, a good thing that, or like something that you should really keep an eye out for is if your loss values are decreasing. If your loss values are decreasing, it means that your model's actually training because the number of uh, testing instances that it's getting correct, that's also increasing. So I'm getting more uh, things correct. 
which is why the loss, which kind of uh, measures how far apart my predictions are from the true labels. So yeah, it should be decreasing. And over here, we can see that the graph, it, just, it, it shows some gradual decay in the loss. And uh, yeah, that's good. So over here, in yeah? Oh yeah, to clear your logs, uh, I should have met, uh, uh, so, actually no, you don't, you don't need to clear the logs because it automatically, uh, it overwrites whatever's there, yeah. Because as you're running these cells, right, it's gonna overwrite all the pre-existing variables or whatever it had in its memory. So yeah, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, sorry? Oh yeah, that, that usually happens when you're running TensorFlow on like something like Jupyter, something on a local machine, not, uh, not a hosted uh, runtime. Because I've gotten that six zero, uh, local host uh, with the port 6006, uh, that usually happens when uh, you're using TensorBoard, when you're not using TensorBoard the way you're supposed to in Colab. Uh, can you check again whether you've written both of these down? First, you need to load the extension, and then you need to call it. Because if you type in TensorBoard on its own, it's gonna assume that you are using uh, TensorBoard uh, using localhost, not something that's hosted online. Which is why when you're using a localhost runtime, you can click another localhost, it'll direct you to another port URL which is why you can see TensorBoard uh, in the way you saw it. But, oh yeah, you can, you can look, uh, yeah, I think that should be fine. And then after that, uh, you can type in percent TensorBoard uh, and specify the logging directory like so. You can try reloading the extension if uh, it doesn't uh, if it doesn't show up in the first try. I think for now, uh, is it possible to refer to the slides on the screen? I think I can uh, quickly brush through, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so TensorBoard, this is what it is. It's a user interface, kind of like a visualization dashboard that you can use to uh, visualize your training and testing metrics, performance metrics. It logs everything and contains metadata on your training performance. So at the same time, uh, earlier I mentioned that TensorFlow, what it does is it creates a computation graph. So to visualize this computation graph, you need to go to the graphs section in the header and you'll be presented with uh, a bunch of boxes with arrows connecting, uh, you know, with uh, arrows connecting each other. So this is called a computation graph. This corresponds to the model that we wrote above here. So the model that I wrote here with, uh, you know, three dense layers, it's the exact same thing that's represented here in the form of a computation graph. So it takes in my input like so. It feeds it through all the layers in my, uh, in my network. It finds the loss value and at the same time it's computing the metrics. So if you were to double click on one of these uh, computation graph nodes, you can actually, it'll, uh, it'll expand and it'll uh, give you a bit more information. So MATMUL over here stands for matrix multiplication. Uh, so earlier I also mentioned that uh, a layer, it computes the W dot X plus B. 
So this is exactly what is, hap is happening. You multiply the x value. So in this matmul node, it's taking in the inputs, multiplying it with the respective weight, and it's adding the bias in this bias add uh, uh, node. So this happens for all the nodes in your computation graph, and that's exactly how, uh, yeah, that's how uh, it's visualized over here. Of course, with TensorFlow, TensorBoard, you can do much more. Depending on the kinds of metrics that you use, you know, custom metrics, you'll have a lot more graphs uh, to show. Yeah, something like this. You have a lot of graphs over here. Uh, it all depends on what kind of metrics you give and what kind of uh, callbacks you're using. Uh, it also uh, uh, kind of specifies what exactly you're trying to track during your training. So now that we have kind of trained a, f uh, a simple three-layer uh, neural network on uh, MNIST, I guess we can go ahead and uh, do something a bit more advanced. So a while back, uh, are there any issues still with the TensorBoard? Hold on. Really? Uh, Check. Let me just plug in my charger. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, on this side, uh, were you able to yeah. get tensor? It works, right? Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, I guess just to bring everyone up to speed. Uh, so yeah, scalars, in the scalars section, you can see all the graphs, all the graphs that, uh, that we tried to log. So it has the loss graph and my accuracy graph. So do you see it? Okay, yeah. So also, when you go to this graphs header, you should see this. You should see this computation graph, right? They're all nodes, and they have arrows connecting to it or edges connecting to it. This is our computation graph. This exactly corresponds to the model that we wrote, uh, you know, in the cells above. Yeah, and you can you can double click one of them, and it'll expand to show you what's happening inside it. So over here we see that the matrix multiplication W times X, like the you're multiplying the incoming input with the weight, and this, you know, we're also adding the bias. Yeah, and you can double click to, to close it. So yeah, this is, uh, uh, I guess, like a quick overview uh, with, you know, MNIST and TensorBoard.
Yeah, yeah, TensorBoard, it's been there ever since version one came out. So it's compatible with everything. It's just that for this specific example, uh, I, I guess to keep up with the most recent developments in TensorFlow, 2.x is the, is the stable release. Okay, so like to the online viewers, the question was why uh, why has Google changed uh, a lot of the API uh, specs when you when we moved from one point version one point one x all the way to version two? Uh, I guess the answer for that is as Keras became the standard for creating models or basically building data pipelines, machine learning pipelines, uh, it was w way easier to use and uh, more convenient. So TensorFlow, they had to do a full 180 degree full flip when changing their, all their low level operations and converting it into like a high level abstraction like Keras. That's why they've deprecated most of the underlying, I guess, ugly code and they've made it much more convenient. It's the, all the sub modules that exist in version two. Uh, it's really convenient to access them and you don't, need, you know, you don't need to bang your head against the wall when trying to make it work. It's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, they had to rewrite a lot of code to uh, bring it up to the, the, the current version. Yeah. But I guess it's, it's for like the benefit of the, the community because, you know, you want many people to be able to use it, both advanced users and beginners. So to kind of cater to both of them, you want to give them what they want. So for advanced users, you want a lot of customizability. For beginners, if you give them the bare minimum, they'll be able to work with it. So yeah, that's why they had to uh, break down uh, quite a bit to uh, construct the, the tf.keras, uh, the complete library. Uh, it's approaching 5.30, I guess like we can uh, speed it up. I have a few uh, demo notebooks that I can, uh, so I have like links to all my notebooks that I'll give soon. Uh, like you can check it uh, after the talk perhaps, yeah. So I, I did have another talk lined up for uh, like a workshop hands-on thing uh, for today. Uh, so. I thought we, if we had time, we could run o run through this uh, COVID-19 x-ray uh, uh, x-ray classification task. You know, uh, so what it is is it's this uh, data set consisting of you know 146 x-ray scans. So you know, uh, from all the past cases in the like in the past two months, uh, uh, you know, one of the professors at uh, the University of Montreal. He compiled all of these X-rays with their, you know, the diagnoses, uh, with the yeah w w diagnosis, and uh, he made it open source on GitHub. So I'll share the notebook where I kind of create a TensorFlow pipeline that takes in all these uh, X-ray images and trains a convolutional neural network, so you can see it at your own time. Actually, yeah, you can uh, you can see it over here. You can access uh, so even to the online viewers because of time constraints, uh, uh, and I guess to prepare for like, uh, is there a next talk after this? Yeah, so uh, I guess for for time, uh, for lack of time, uh, I think you can speed up and like close uh, close the session for today. Uh, so yeah, these are the two notebooks that I wrote. Uh, a while back to prepare for this talk. So this is like a, uh, the complete version of uh, you know all the code. Uh, it uh, has no errors, so you can uh, download the notebook into your own Google Drive, and you can connect it, and you can run all of them. And for even for one of them, actually the MNIST tutorial, 
I have hooked it up to the, the, the hosted GPU. So you don't need to run it on your local machine anymore. So if you go to the MNIST version and uh, run all of them, it runs on the GPU. And the same thing for the COVID-19 uh, uh, training data set task. Uh, when you run this notebook, all of it's on the GPU. So no matter which device you're running your code on, uh, you should get some really fast performance upgrades. So yeah, so it's device agnostic, shouldn't really be a problem. All right, so I guess now that we're kind of finished more of the, the coding segment, uh, I think I can wrap it up here. So in this tutorial, uh, what I've covered is the basics of TensorFlow, uh, uh, a bit of history, why it was created, what it provides. Uh, I've gone through the model, uh, the models API, the layers API, uh, TensorBoard to visualize all your performance or training, uh, training metrics. Uh, so Keras backend, uh, it was supposed to be covered in the second talk, but what it does is it provides you with some low level operations, uh, like, you know, the mean, sum, square, uh, absolute, uh, dot product, argmax. It provides you all these tools so that you can write your own loss function. You can write your own, uh, optimizer. You can write your own, uh, metrics to track. So yeah, you could do this all with the Keras backend. And in the second notebook, the COVID-19 notebook, uh, it has a segment for custom metrics and custom loss functions. And yeah, so when, with TensorFlow, what you can do is you can do you know, data collection, you can do data pre-processing, you can load data sets, your own data sets are the ones provided by TensorFlow. Uh, you can create, build, uh, you can build and train test models, and you can even visualize their uh, performance in TensorBoard. And, you know, once you're happy with its performance, you can actually, uh, you know, push it to production. Uh, you can put it up on specialized hardware using this thing called uh, TensorFlow Serving, which allows you to take the model, the frozen weights, and serve it uh, uh, in the cloud. So all you need to do is you know, give it an API call and you can get back the predictions. So if you are in Singapore and uh, you uh, would want to explore more about TensorFlow, uh, you, can, you can consider joining the TensorFlow and Deep Learning Singapore Meetup group. So me, uh, when you go to meetup.com, you can search up TensorFlow and Deep Learning Singapore and you can become a member. It's the largest uh, TensorFlow meetup group on the planet today. It's growing really quickly. So er, it holds talks every month. So there, you know, we have lightning talks, you know, those five minute talks where someone comes and presents their projects, or we have the hosts or uh, someone from, you know, all these big corporations using machine learning, they come over and they uh, kind of give us a glimpse as to what that company is doing or their ML teams are doing. And or uh, another thing that you know the TFDL meetup does is uh, it covers like cutting edge research papers. So uh, all the fancy research that's taking place at Google Brain, uh, at DeepMind, OpenAI, uh, they write up the code or they are uh, take that paper and convert that into like TensorFlow code, and they kind of do like a live demo. Uh, at the talk. So if you're considering uh, joining, uh, there are lots of benefits. Uh, first, you get the network. At the same time, you're learning really cool things about TensorFlow. Uh, if you're confident enough to like, you know, create your own side project and you want to demo it in front of you know, 200 odd people uh, for a given session, uh, you can uh, if you just become a member. Additionally, uh, if you want something a bit more uh, low level or low key, you can join the DevSpace Singapore at the Google APAC headquarters. So DevSpace is, uh, well, a space for uh, all the community events related to developers and programming in general. So almost monthly they have dif different talks uh, about a wide range of topics, some machine learning, some uh, web development, some, uh, I guess, app development. Uh, so yeah, for all their machine learning and TensorFlow talks, you can, uh, you can try attending them. Uh, other than that, 
if you do have any doubts or you want to reach out, if you have any questions about the talk or machine learning, AI in general, you can try connecting with me on any one of these platforms. I'm active on GitHub, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and uh, medium.com. Uh, when I share the, the slides URL, you can actually click one of these images and it'll, uh, it'll take you to one of the profiles. Well, yeah, other than that, uh, well, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, uh, whoever well, showed up and like to the online viewers. Uh, yeah, uh, any questions? And if you want to access the slides, I showed it up in the front, you can access it at this URL. So if you want to take a picture or you want to uh, come back later uh, or you want to review the content, especially the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, data set uh, task, you can come back to this on, uh, well, slide, slideshow at this URL, fa-tf-2020. Yeah, other than that, uh, no, thank you for coming. Uh, it's kind of like late into the evening, especially on a Friday. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Uh, there are some parts that did seem kind of dull because, uh, well, you need to have kind of like a deep intuition of what's going on underneath. Uh, like to fully understand what TensorFlow is doing surface level, uh, which is why some parts may seem like, you know, what am I saying? So, yeah, but the more you kind of delve into TensorFlow, the more you do side projects or the more you explore or read, in, or read its documentation, the more you'll kind of understand what's going on uh, under the hood, uh, which kind of simplifies the entire thing. So, yeah, uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>